Welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's webinar on the impact of COVID-19, what issuers and underwriters in the debt capital market space should know. I would like to turn the webinar over to David Cameron, a partner and co-chair of Dorsey's India Practice Group. David? Hi, everyone, and thank you, Rima. Um, we've had a great set of RSVPs for the session today um, from across Asia and in particular in India. So thank you everyone for making the time to join us today. I'm here together with Devlin Nasaha, who will be your presenter and also my fellow Capital Markets partner, Kenny Kwok. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. The length of this session, we are aiming for, third, for sorry, 60 minutes. Um, if we do go over and you, and you need to drop, that's fine. But again, we will endeavor to keep this within 60 minutes. Uh, along those same lines, just to make it a, an efficient session, um, we do not plan to have a live Q&A. Uh, that doesn't mean that we uh, welcome questions in the conversation. Uh, just please reach out to us separately via email after the session, and we'd be happy to continue the co conversation with you directly. Uh, so with that, thank you again for joining us. I'm going to hand it, hand it over first to uh, Kenny Kwok, who's been a partner here at Dorsey for 20 years and active in the India market for 15 years. Uh, so Kenny, I will hand it over to you. Sorry, it'd be good if I unmuted myself. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, David, um, for for the introduction, and thank you all for joining today. We're very excited to um, to be able to share some insights um, that we think are relevant to key players in the DCM space. Um, you know, just just a brief introduction for those of you who may not be as familiar with Dorsey, but I think most of you probably are. Um, you know, we're we're a 108 year old firm. Um, originally out of the US, but now international and across Asia and, and, and Europe, experts and leaders in, in cross-border finance and capital markets. Um, we're celebrating this year 25 years in Asia. Our Hong Kong office is um, 25 years old, um, actually as of this month, uh, or last month, a April actually. Um, and 15 years of, uh, of uh, doing business in India. So we're very proud of, of these um, milestones and, and the length of our relationships uh, with our friends and contacts. Uh, India Capital Markets is uh, very near and dear to um, our hearts, uh, David, uh, Devalina, and I. Um, and uh, we thought while a lot of us are sitting around in our lockdown spaces, um, you know, there are things to think about uh, while we're in this uh, COVID situation and as we uh, hopefully um, uh, trend out of it, what do we need to think about you know, as key players in the market, issuers and underwriters and legal uh, advisors. So, um, you know, we've got uh, a good 60 minutes of uh, uh, discussion to share with you, and, and we're honored that um, you've decided to uh, to share those uh, 60 minutes with us. And um, with that, I'd like to pass the baton over to, to Devalina uh, to kickstart the presentation. Um, thanks, Kenny, uh, and a very good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar. Uh, but before we proceed with the webinar, keeping true to our Dorsey principles of always keeping our family, meaning our clients' interest and well-being at the very first, um, we here at Dorsey, David, Kenny, and myself especially, hope that all of you and your family are keeping safe in these unprecedented um, times. Now, what I've done with the presentation today is um, divided the presentation into broadly um, two parts. In the first part, I plan to perhaps uh, drill down the impact of COVID-19 on the Indian economy so far, and then proceed to discuss a few things that um, issuers and underwriters may want to be on the uh, lookout for or incorporate in transaction documents, including the offering circular, in the context of a debt capital markets transaction. And uh, hopefully along the way, many of you will pick up something that's useful in the context of a proposed um, transaction in the near future. Now, coming to the impact of um, COVID-19, <laughs> I mean, I don't think the devastating effect of COVID-19 is uh, news to anyone, but the few slides that I plan to show you now may perhaps be helpful in putting things into context and helping us acknowledge uh, 
the true degree of the devastation that is slowly unfolding um, before us. I mean, on 12th April 2020, um, uh, you had the World Bank say that the coronavirus outbreak has quote unquote severely disrupted um, the Indian economy and the Indian economy is now estimated to decelerate to 5% in 2020. And additionally, uh, the World Bank projected a sharp growth deceleration in fiscal 2021 to 2.8% in a baseline scenario. Um, continuing in the same breath, you had the Federation of Indian Chambers and Commerce and Industry conduct a survey uh, that showed that 53% of Indian businesses have indicated a marked impact of COVID-19 on business operations. As far as ratings go, again, it's no surprise. You had S&P Global Ratings um, slash India's fiscal 2021 growth forecast to 3.5%, um, India Ratings and Research to 3.6%, um, Moody's Investor Services to 2.5% and Fitch to 2%. I mean, since economic liberalization in the 1990s, these are the lowest growth figures India has um, witnessed. Um, we saw the stock markets in India post their worst losses in history on 23rd of March 2020 when Sensex fell over 4,000 points. And um, not surprising, the complete shutdown in India due to COVID-19 is now expected to cause a loss of over 120 billion USD to the economy. Now, the situation is definitely more grave than the 2008 financial crisis, and this is more so evident in the fact uh, that the International Monetary Fund has predicted that the Great Lockdown would spark uh, the worst global downtown since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Now, I think I should simply take a pause here to let all of us digest uh, these negative figures and numbers and grim reality that COVID-19 is making us all witness. But being the perpetually optimist person that I am, um, I'm quite reluctant to move on to the next section of my presentation without giving us all a little bit of hope and positivity. I mean, I understand while all the figures seem to suggest that we are heading towards a recession, I think we should not simply make a predetermined conclusion of a complete disaster. Um, how the Indian economy will be affected and how quickly it will rebound will all depend a lot on how well the virus is contained. And I'm sure so far everyone on this webinar would agree that India has taken unprecedented steps in containing the virus. And given the length and breadth of the country, I think India has done extremely well in limiting the spread of the virus. Um, one must also not forget that India has a large domestic economy and dependence on exports is relatively low. So I personally think that as long as the government can ensure liquidity in the market and prevent job losses, India should be able to rebound from the ill effects of COVID-19 relatively quickly. And of course, a crucial factor to the path of growth would definitely be uh, to see how quickly demand returns um, to the market. Now, on that note of positivity, uh, let me start the second session of the webinar. Um, in this second part of the webinar, I plan to discuss some key takeaways for both the issuers and the underwriters who are looking to raise funds in this um, continuing COVID-19 era or even post-COVID-19 era in the debt capital markets um, space. Um, to begin with, I think all of us will agree that now is indeed an interesting time to uh, raise capital by any issuer. And uh, issuers more so now than ever before would need to monitor contractual obligations more closely, uh, specifically those revolving around force majeure and material adverse clauses. Needless to say, issuers should also now keenly focus on their disclosure requirements due diligence process, um, compliance with continuing obligations, additional compliances that may, be, that may be required by new legislations, financial reporting obligations, and corporate governance issues. Now, having listed all the things that issuers should be on the lookout for, what I plan to do over in the next few slides is to deal with each of these points in more detail. 
Um, coming to force majeure, I mean, I know a lot has been said, said and spoken on the topic of COVID-19 and the interplay of force majeure clauses. So I'll try and keep it simple. Uh, the term itself means superior force and it has its origins in French civil law. Uh, the key thing perhaps to remember is that under English law or the law of another common law jurisdiction such as India, there is no doctrine of force majeure. I mean, instead the term force majeure um, and the provisions that we normally see in contractual obligations is a convenient label, if I may call it, that is used to refer to clauses which relieve a party from performance of its from performing its contractual obligations where that performance is impacted by events outside the party's control, say, for example, such as natural disasters or war. Therefore, in the context of uh, debt capital markets and the interplay of COVID-19, um, the four key questions that the issuer should ponder over should always uh, be if the force majeure clause firstly has been drafted to be included in the interpretation, uh, sorry, if, if COVID-19 has been included uh, in the interpretation of the force majeure clause. Secondly, whether such an act has prevented, hindered, or delayed the underwriters from performing the obligations that such underwriters owed to the issuer. Thirdly, whether non-performance was due to circumstances outside of the control of the underwriters. And lastly, whether there were no reasonable steps that the underwriters could have taken to avoid or mitigate against the event. Uh, takeaway number one for the issuer would be that if the answer to all of the above questions that I've just said, um, so if the answer to all the above questions is a yes, the underwriters would be able to exercise the right granted to them by the force majeure clause of the agreement. Um, therefore, the key question that the issuer should ponder over is whether COVID-19 has made the performance of the obligation impossible. Um, in fact, under English law, performance becoming more burdensome or more expensive is no excuse whatsoever for the underwriters to not perform their duty. Therefore, what is perhaps important is that the issuer clearly identifies the risks and the consequences of the default if any party were to exercise the provision of force majeure against the issuer well in advance so that the issuer has some contingency plan to act upon. Now in the debt capital markets transactions which are governed by English law, the force majeure clause is drafted as part of the termination clause in favor of the underwriters in the program agreement or the subscription agreement. Now, similar to English law transactions in US offerings, underwriting agreements routinely contain the force majeure and termination clauses, permitting the underwriters to terminate their obligations under the underwriting agreement. If in their judgment, there has been a sharp downturn in the market conditions or deterioration of the financial condition or business of the issuer between the signing of the underwriting agreement and the scheduled closing of the offering. Um, such that consummating the offering would be impracticable. Uh, typical force majeure clauses extend to occurrences of natural disasters or calamities, such as outbreak of hostilities or suspension of trading in the United States, or in certain cases, uh, even in non-US um, markets. Uh, perhaps the best example of a force majeure clause that we regularly come across in the debt capital market space would be the ICMA standard force majeure clause, as you can see in the slide. Um, this is not exactly the ICMA standard force majeure clause, but I've taken this clause out of one of our uh, transaction documents, but this clause is based on the ICMA uh, standard clause. I'll not go into reading this clause word to word, but a plain reading of the clause is good to send any issuer into a worry mode. And many underwriters actually tend to view the unilateral right to declare a force majeure event and to terminate as a fundamental protection provided to them in the underwriting agreement. Now, generally in the context of the bond offerings that we see out of India and on which David and myself have been helping out for many years now, we've rarely seen underwriters exercise their right to a force majeure. Uh, 
I mean, principally because of the limited period of time between the signing of the underwriting agreement and the closing of the offering, and also because of the reputational risk that the underwriters would bring upon themselves by suing an issuer. Therefore, takeaway number two for the issuer would be that rarely are force majeure clauses exercised by underwriters against the issuers. Now, one thing the issuers would need to bear in mind is that the underwriters would be relieved of their duty of underwriting, even in the absence of a force majeure clause and an agreement, if the doctrine of frustration under English law comes into play. Now, under English law, a contract will terminate automatically when a frustrating event occurs after the entering of the contract. Um, an event that was unexpected or beyond the party's control and which makes performance impossible or radically different from that which the parties contemplated at the time of entering into the contract. Now, precedents uh, show that courts usually require very high standards for enforcing this principle, so underwriters may be unable to take recourse um, under such a principle. Um, Perhaps takeaway number uh, three for the issuer could be that given that COVID-19 is um, currently an ongoing event, an issuer may want to raise the bar of materiality of the impact of COVID-19 than what it is as of customary today for triggering the termination provision by the underwriters. Um, having said this, let me come uh, perhaps to the next big focus point for issuers, which would perhaps be to keep an eye out on the material adverse clause in any transaction document. Now, as COVID-19 is currently an ongoing event, the adverse effects of the pandemic would have already been disclosed in the offering circular and appropriate representations which are generally provided for by the issuer and the relevant agreement would already have been provided for by the issuer against the benchmark of this present continuing COVID-19 disclosure in the offering circular. Now, as many of us would already know that a MAC clause can only, um, only covers for situations where a new development has taken place, which was previously not, not disclosed for in the offering circular. Therefore, um, the next takeaway for the issuer could be, and that would be takeaway number four, that it is unlikely that the underwriters can avail of the MAC provision between the signing and closing period, given that a disclosure on COVID-19 would have already been benchmarked in the offering circular. Um, now coming to takeaway, uh, point number five that could be relevant for the issuer. Um, the issuer would do good to keep a close eye for um, business day definitions and notice periods that are being included in the various transaction documents. I mean, it would help if the issuers try and negotiate these provisions to allow for ample time, keeping in mind the breakdown in transportation and the adverse effects that COVID-19 has had on the um, issuer's business. I mean, similarly, prior to potentially launching a transaction, um, please do keep an eye out for the validity of prior consents that may have been issued and to check whether in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, the validity of such prior consents would remain unhinged. Um, it, in, in this context, I think I should also point out that a good practice uh, could be that the definition of business days is hinged on the particular entity in relation to which a business day is referenced to. I mean, given that due to COVID-19, many organizations are having irregular working hours, the standard business day definition may not provide adequate time for undertaking the contemplated activity. Um, in such situations, if an activity, say, for example, would require input from the Singapore Stock Exchange or the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, it is best to define the business days in relation to the functioning of these entities as, say, for example, SGX business days or Hong Kong Stock Exchange business days, which could then be defined to mean the actual days on which these entities were functioning during the COVID-19 period. Now, having said this, um, let's now discuss the topic that can understandably give more headache to the issuer than others, which is a disclosure uh, requirements. 
Now, the key to remember during this discussion is that disclosure documents exist um, so that invest investors can make an informed investment decision. And therefore, takeaway uh, point number six for the issuer would be that um, the risk factors, investment considerations, business, MDNA, chapters of the offering circular would definitely need to clearly lay out the effect of uh, the uncertainty and unpredictability that has been brought about by COVID-19. Um, coming to risk factors, um, a generic risk factor on the pandemic that we usually see in offering circulars coming out of Asia um, may be insufficient um, to cover for COVID-19. I mean, given the severity of COVID-19 and the fact that it continues to spread even as we speak now, I think that COVID-19 itself uh, dictates that we have a specific and separate risk factor uh, for it. Now, in this context, uh, for more clarifications as to what may be helpful for the issuer uh, to consider before considering what risk factors should come into the offering circular or be disclosed in it, um, it may be helpful to go um, through the SCC guidance, which can be found at the website that I've mentioned um, in the slide. Now, as regards risk factors, um, there are about five or six points that the issuer should, in the light of um, COVID-19, ask itself. Uh, firstly, um, is the issuer's cost of or access to capital and funding sources likely to change due to COVID-19? Is the issuer likely to breach covenants of its credit agreements or incur any material COVID-19 related contingencies? Thirdly, um, does the issuer anticipate any material impairments, increases in allowances for credit losses, restructuring charges, other expenses, um, or changes in accounting judgments that are reasonably likely to have a material impact on the issuer's financial statements? Um, has the issuer experienced challenges in implementing its business continuity plans? Uh, does the issuer expect COVID-19 to materially affect the demand for its products or services? Uh, so these questions can definitely prove to be helpful guidance for the issuer to determine what risk factors should go into the offering circular. Uh, now coming to recent developments, I mean, given that COVID-19 is a recent development, issuers wanting to go in for a drawdown under a previously updated MTN offering circular may want to include a recent development section on COVID-19 in the supplemental note offering circular, clearly highlighting the impact of the virus on the industry or on its business, as well as the steps um, the issuer has already taken to counter the virus, um, along with any additional steps that the issuer is currently implementing to limit the damage, both in the near, short term, as well as the long term. Now, as regards the business section of the offering circular, um, I think it's absolutely important that issuers uh, would need to clearly detail the impact of COVID-19 on its business and industry. I mean, especially if the issuer's business operations are conducted in regions that have been heavily affected by COVID-19, or the issuers involved in sectors such as real estate development, tourism and entertainment, transportation, manufacturing, or other sectors that have been heavily impacted uh, by COVID-19. Now, as the business section typically begins uh, with a discussion of overviews, strengths, and strategies, if COVID-19 has impacted any of these subsections, then the issuer should consider providing specific details. Um, when disclosing the performance of the issuer's business lines, any significant or material delays or declines attributable to COVID-19 pandemic may need to be described in order to give an investor a complete picture of the issuer's um, business. Uh, for example, any material decreases in um, revenue or profit that are attributable to COVID-19, especially occurring after, say, the latest audited financial statements should be disclosed and explained. Now, in this regard, SEC recommends um, some questions to consider. Uh, for example, if the issuer anticipates a material adverse impact of COVID-19 on its supply chain 
or the methods used to distribute the issuers' products or services? Also, is there going to be a material change in the relationship between costs and revenues? Uh, will the issuer's operations or business goals going to be materially impacted by any constraints or other impacts on its human capital resources and productivity or say by travel restrictions and border close, uh, closures? Therefore, to summarize, the issuer and the business section would definitely need to disclose the seriousness of the impact of the virus. Um, both on the issuer's business as well as overall industry, and especially if the issuer has operations or supply or import flowing from any of the geographical locations heavily affected um, by COVID-19. Uh, coming to the next slide on um, MDNA. Um, now, for the management's discussion and analysis of financial condition chapter, the issuer here would need to discuss um, the analysis of trends or expected fluctuations in the company's liquidity and capital resources, uh, provide an analysis of any defaults or arrears or significant risk thereof on the company's ability to make key payments and its ability to satisfy its debt covenants, a discussion of how the company intends to address any actual or potential default and the expected uh, source of funds to meet the company's uh, capital expenditure commitments. Now, uh, this disclosure may also include, say, where appropriate, discussion on whether the company expects to receive financial support from any government stimulus program or expects that its customers or suppliers will receive such, such support and how the company's business will be affected if um, such support does not materialize. Now, with regard to MDNA disclosure, the SEC guidance lays down some helpful questions for consideration by the issuer. For example, um, how has COVID-19 impacted the issuer's financial condition and results of operation, including future operating results and near and long-term financial condition? Um, does the issuer expect that COVID-19 will impact future operations differently than how it has affected the current period? How has COVID-19 impacted the issuer's capital and um, financial resources and has the issuer's cost of or access to capital and funding sources changed? Um, has the issuer's sources or users of cash otherwise being materially impacted? And if yes, what course of action has the issuer taken or proposed to take to remedy um, the, def the deficiency? Uh, the issuer may also disclose known trends and uncertainties as it relates to the issuer's ability to service its debt or other financial obligations, access the debt markets, um, changes in terms requested by counterparties, um, changes in valuation of collateral and counterparty or customer risk. Now, in similar lines, uh, the issuer may also consider disclosing whether the issuer expects COVID-19 to affect assets on its balance sheet and its ability to time the account for those assets. Um, lastly, the issuer could also consider has COVID-19 related circumstances such as remote work arrangements adversely affected the issuer's ability to maintain its operations? And if so, what changes in the issuer's controls have occurred that materially affect the issuer's internal control over financial reporting and what challenges does the issuer anticipate in its ability to maintain these systems and controls? Now, similarly for critical accounting estimate, it's important to discuss um, the underlying assumptions that relate to matters highly uncertain at the time the estimate was made and any known trends, commitments, events, or uncertainties that the issuer reasonably believes will materially affect the methodology or the assumptions um, described. Now, uh, takeaway number seven for the issuer um, could be that uh, it is better for the issuer now, especially given the COVID-19 situation, to use terms such as we believe and others that denote opinion more generously um, now than ever before to indicate that such statements are forward-looking statements. The reason being that federal securities law do not impose a duty to update a forward-looking statement. However, uh, the issuer should remember that it is still under a duty to correct prior disclosure that it made 
which is untrue, which it determines was untrue at the time um, that it was made. Um, also, the issuer um, should consider uh, providing such opinion in the offering circular, considering that it's more difficult for plaintiffs to challenge statements of opinion as opposed to statements of fact. Um, now, coming to now, having discussed previously the changes that we need to bring about in the offering circular in light of uh, COVID-19, a related topic for concern uh, for many issuers would be um, the due diligence uh, process. Now, in this sphere, takeaway number eight for the issuer could be that. Um, Given the travel ban and lockdown in many countries, um, issuers would need to ensure that online data rooms are created for purposes of documentary due diligence. Now, this may of course involve additional expense and be cumbersome to issuers that have long been established or uh, do not have adequate infrastructure to organize such on online platforms. Now, further in, in, in case where the issuer has any business connection to China or any of the majorly affected COVID-19 places, the issuer should be prepared uh, to answer due diligence queries on the size of the issuer's business in such regions, the status of its operations, the impact and degree of disruption to business due to COVID-19, the issuer's current cash flow status and impact of COVID-19 on its upcoming um, financials. And needless to say, the issuer should also be prepared to apprise everyone on the steps that it has undertaken, including investments and capital expenditure to mitigate the damage uh, caused by COVID-19. Now, having discussed the uh, disclosure and due diligence requirements, uh, the next topic that may be of interest to the issuer would be the continuing or ongoing obligations. Now, where the issuer's securities have already been listed and the issuer is under an obligation to pay out the principal and interest amount, but due to the impact of COVID-19, it's unable to do so, the key takeaway for the issuer, and this would be takeaway number nine, would be that it has the option to conduct uh, liability management exercises to restructure its debt for example, exchange old bonds, opt out for consent solicitation process, etc. Also, the issuer would need to determine whether any developments have taken place that would have a bearing on the investment decision of the investors or be considered inside information or becoming or, or become an ongoing trend. And accordingly, the issuer would need to comply with various obligations under the Securities Exchange Act or the listing rules, the transparency rules, the market abuse regulation, the financial conduct authorities, disclosure guidance and transparency rules, the L London Stock Exchange's admission and disclosure standards. Now in the Indian context, um, many of you would already know that the Securities and Exchange Board of India has already extended the due date for regulatory filings and compliances uh, for, re for REITs and INVITs for the period ending 31st of March 2020 by over a month uh, than the timelines that are prescribed under the relevant um, legislations. Um, coming to financial reporting, I mean, it's no brainer and takeaway number 10 for the issuer would be that the issuer would need to beef up disclosure relating to subsequent developments due to COVID-19 in the notes to financial statement section and the relevant information provided would definitely need to be holistic and cannot be selective. Um, in this context, it may be worth mentioning that the Securities and Exchange Board of India has granted an extension of 45 days to listed entities and filing their quarterly financial results. Um, in respect of annual financial results, SEBI has also extended the due date of filings by a month. Um, that is up to 30th June um, 2020. Okay, this brings me to my next slide on corporate <laughs> governance obligations. Now, as regards corporate governance obligations, it is understandable that due to the restrictions on assembling and travel, holding of annual general meetings or board meetings may be difficult um, to conduct. Um, in this context, it may be worth to highlight that the Singapore Stock Exchange, for example, has allowed companies an extension until 
30th June 2020 for holding off annual general meetings approving um, the December 31st 2019 results and uh, similarly the Ministry of Corporate Affairs in India has with certain exceptions um, generally allowed all companies to take decisions of urgent nature requiring approval of members or shareholders of the company without actually holding a general meeting uh, requiring physical presence of members at a common place. Uh, the NC has also amended um, provisions to provide that all the matters which earlier required physical presence of directors at a board meeting can now be approved at a board meeting held via a video conference or other audiovisual means um, till 30th June 2020. Okay, now having enumerated these 10 takeaways for the issuer, um, I'm keen to discuss some helpful steps that underwriters may consider um, adopting. Now, I think that given, um, given that unlike litigation in a capital markets transaction, all parties are working towards the same goal. So the 10 takeaways for the issuer that I discussed earlier uh, would be helpful guidance um, for the underwriters uh, too. Uh, as already discussed, uh, the underwriters have a right to termination under the subscription agreement. And given that the force majeure clause is a clause that works in favor of the underwriters, it is in the underwriters' best interest that they mention the term COVID-19 in the force majeure clause itself. Um, a prescriptive definition of the force majeure clause will uh, not completely capture any unanticipated event that occurs which parties did not consider See at the time they drafted the clause, and on the other hand, a very broad definition of force majeure clause may lead to uncertainty. I think for this reason, the best approach uh, for the underwriters would be to have an inclusive definition of force majeure, uh, which lists the events that would trigger the force majeure clause, but then also include a catch-all provision to ensure that the definition does not preclude the application of the clause to other um, similar events. Um, in the context of COVID-19, uh, underwriters can distinguish themselves by uh, laying out the scope of um, diligence clearly and correctly to the issuer and the auditors as early as possible. And it would be, of course, helpful to take some input from the lawyers in this process. Um, it's also imperative that underwriters would need to ask relevant and meaningful questions in the various due diligence sessions to bring to the forefront the appropriate risk factors um, to investors. Um, similarly, logistical issues regarding roadshows would need to be discussed upfront. Uh, possible solutions could be, of course, net roadshows and investor conference calls with appropriate built-in measures to prevent restricted investor groups from being present in such um, roadshows. And um, lastly, though few in number, I know there are certain issuers um, that are keen on physical signing as part of their internal compliance requirements. Uh, so such issuers should be apprised that a physical signing of the documents may not be possible. And also various parties who generally require original documents as part of their in-house requirements may need to be socialized to be just fine with uh, scanned or electronic copies of um, documents. Um, having said this, now it brings me to the last part of the presentation is, um, which is uh, what lessons can we gather um, a few pointers in this direction. The first and foremost being that um, there, there should be a clear guard against insider trading and selective disclosure. Uh, there should be absolutely full disclosure on impact of uh, COVID-19 on the demand, sales, manufacturing, operations, employees of the issuer. And it's also a good time uh, for the issuer and for parties to review all prior disclosure in the offering circular. Um, issuers would do better to use such terms as we believe and similarly, <clears throat> and others that denote opinion more generously. And financial reporting and auditing and reviewing process should be as robust as they can possibly, as they can possibly be. Um, 
Well, in conclusion, all that I can say is that uh, what we've discussed during today's presentation are only some of the things that the issuers and the underwriters would need to keep in mind. I mean, additional specific requirements may arise um, depending on the facts and situations of each particular issuance or the issuer. And to that extent, please always feel free to connect with David, Kenny, or myself, and we'd be happy to um, help or take a quick glance at any provision of a transaction document uh, that you may want us to review in light of the ongoing uh, pandemic. And for any questions that you may have on the slides that I've presented today, please always feel free to get in touch with me at saha.devalina.dorsey.com. And um, I think that's pretty much it for today's presentation. Thank you for your time.